Thank you. Thank you. So, um, yeah, uh, last time I explained vertex models and Yang Baxter equation and how you can use it to get uh, Cauchy identities and other properties of symmetric functions. So, basically, yesterday was vertex models and symmetric functions. Here, uh, I'm going to be discussing vertex models and probability today. So, that's the, that's the goal. And uh, I'm going to talk about stochastic six vertex model. So uh, the, vertex the, the vertex states uh, in the stochastic six vertex model are uh, six possible configurations, which I call, uh, which have weights one, uh, this has weight B2, this has weight B1, this has weight one minus B2, this has weight one minus B1, and uh, Bi are between zero and one. So, I can um, consider different boundary conditions for this one. Uh, so, uh, remember these are stochastic. So, the stochastic condition, by the way, the stochastic condition for a vertex model is just uh, that the sum over all KL of, uh, of the outputs is 1 for, for any i and j. That's the stochastic condition. Now I want the weights to be non-negative so that I can do probability to them. And uh, this restricts my generality. So in the six vertex language, this is a so-called uh, ferroelectric, ferroelectric phase, which means that the model behaves like, sometimes it behaves like a dimer model, conjecturally. Uh, and uh, it doesn't exhibit gas phases. There, there is no gas. You cannot put boundary conditions so that these weights will give you gas, conjecturally. Um, now, the boundary conditions that one wants to understand and which are poorly understood is the domain wall boundary conditions. When you have, when you have arrows incoming and outgoing uh, on one side and empty on the other side, and then you put... Uh, uniform weights or stochastic weights or some other general weights. So you can actually, uh, you can show by, by looking at invariance because boundary conditions, having boundary conditions means that you can renormalize the weights or change something uh, there so that actually if you, put, if you put parameters here, arbitrary parameters, then you can renormalize out so there are only two parameters left. And uh, anyway, so you can, you can actually consider um, also, you can actually pick B1, B2 such that this is going to be uniform distribution. Well, B2, B1, B2 has to be complex for that. But anyway, so, um, so for, for general six vertex model, we would like to understand the Arctic curve, which is a classical dimer uh, thinking or random tiling thinking. So uh, what's a dimer curve? So it consists of four parts, uh, like this one separates emptiness with a random mixture of paths, and then here you have a phase that the paths are densely packed like this, and here you have a phase that the paths are packed like this, and here they, they're packed like this. And it's, you know, depending on the parameters, but might be a symmetric curve. So we have, uh, we have the proof, uh, Amol Agarwal proved the existence of the curve and formulas for the curve. We don't know the density inside, we don't know how the local phases look like, uh, local translation variant uh, Gibbs, ergodic Gibbs measures. We don't, we don't know, we don't have a good control of them. Yes? Mm, it's a gluing together of four algebraic curves. So they're glued here. Um, so uh, instead of the main wall, we can also do half the main wall where the situation is much different and much better. So, so this, I mean, conjecturally, this is Conjecturally, this, this is dimer-like, so dimer-like, meaning you just sample it, you look at this and see, well, yeah, I can, I can see the same picture in dimers, sort of, again. Well, it's not a determinant process, so you can, it's not exactly uh, dimer, but, but in the half domain wall boundary conditions, you, get, you actually have a different, different behavior. So, so there is a, you know, conjecturally, there is conformable invariance, Gaussian free field, and all that, but um, in the half-domain wall boundary condition, you actually have a, 
and it's proven uh, because it's an easier problem. I mean, it's still hard work, but uh, it was proven by Boris and Corin and Gorin uh, that the paths actually fill a cone uh, of slope u and one over u, where u is is a parameter depending on b's. So here I'm I'm picking uh, b2 to be greater than b1, so that you want to go right more than you want to go up, and uh, u is uh, one minus b. 2 divided by 1 minus b1, less than 1, and uh, you get two phases here, and then in, the, in between the cone, in between the uh, slopes u and 1 over u, you get a random mixture of paths. Now, does it have a Gaussian free field behavior? No, it doesn't have a Gaussian free field behavior. It actually has a, a KPZ behavior. So what you see is a KPZ type asymptotics, which I'm going to formulate KPZ type asymptotics. Um, so let me formulate the theorem that, um, so I define the height function h of xy to be the number of paths below xy in the plane. So here the height function is zero. Okay? Here the height function grows linearly equal to x minus y. And here it's nonlinear. So then, uh, uh, epsilon inverse h of x epsilon y epsilon converges to uh, 0 or y minus x above the cone, 0 below the cone, and in the cone you get uh, square root of y minus square root of ux squared over 1 minus u, so in the cone. And uh, then uh, when you take the height function and this is the fluctuation, so this is a low large numbers result, this is a fluctuation result, then you subtract uh, some kind of a, so, so subtract this, this is, this is called h, and the fluctuations only happen in the, in the, inside the cone. Um, so inside the cone, divide this by epsilon uh, to the minus one third, and this, this, this goes to, to the tracy widom. GUE distribution. So this behaves like um, largest uh, eigenvalue of a random matrix, or like a location of a particle in a particle system with, you know, with tacit-like interactions, or I don't know, with with strong interactions. So it's not. Is that like one-dimensional, and you're looking at some two-dimensional? What do you mean one dimensional, two dimensional? The random matrix? Yeah. If you're looking well, at this behaves. So, in what way is the trace of Widom? I mean. So, you're looking at here, you're looking at a single random variable for each x and y. And there is, of course, some normalization that you need here. Um, so, you take a random matrix, and its largest eigenvalue is a random variable. And so the distribution of the largest eigenvalue and the distribution of that converges to the same limit. You mean the fluctuations of the largest eigenvalue. Right. Yeah, distribution of fluctuations in both cases converge to the same limit. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so how to kind of reconcile... Uh, Sorry, but uh, yes. I mean, this depends on x and y, and the eigenvalue only depends on... It's universal. So for every x, y, you just normalize it. Uh, ah, so it only depends on the on the height. Right. Um, right. So so this is yeah. This is a limit in epsilon for for. Uh, it's not a field. It's not a process. Uh, although if you take a field, it will be like an airy sheet or something like that. So some 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 related object. Yeah. Um, okay. So how to reconcile the two pictures, dimers and particle systems? Well, it's actually. It's actually pretty easy to explain what happens if you condition this thing, right? Because if I pick boundary conditions like this, you get something. If you pick boundary conditions to be free, then it behaves like a Markov chain. So you can reconcile this by. Uh, so, so this is this is again this is speculative. It's not it's not proven, but gives you some ideas of what what happens. So suppose you pick, you take a stochastic six vertex model on the cylinder. Let it evolve. You know, every every path will 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 wrap around the cylinder. So you have you have a cylinder 
system with some density. Suppose the cylinder has size n. And uh, if you just take particles and let them evolve freely, and I don't even, I didn't, I didn't even tell you what, what it is on the cylinder because it's a discrete time evolution. So when, um, when you go layer to layer, you have to tell me, I have to tell you which, you know, which spin first starts moving. And uh, I, I don't know, let's, let, let's just pick one at random or something. Start, start, start evolving it. So, uh, but when you, when you let the spins evolve freely, then you would, get, you would get this type of behavior, this type of result, okay? And uh, it means that when you have a fixed density, then, then, you will, then the slope of the paths will kind of follow the density. Okay, there is, a, uh, there is actually a formula for, for slope. So if you have density rho, then slope is, uh, is a function of rho. It's kind of a rational function of rho, depends, depending on u. Now, um, to get other behavior, dimer-like behavior, you want to condition the slope, you want to condition the current of particles so that the particles move uh, atypically. So either they move too slow or they move too fast. So there are two ways to condition, right? So either, so if, if they're free, then you get the KPZ behavior. If they're too slow or too fast, then, um, so, so you, you condition on, condition on. Take one system condition on some atypical behavior, that condition has very small probability in finite, in finite setting it makes sense, but in the asymptotics it changes everything. So if it's too slow, like what's the probability by the way, like how small is this probability? So for, for the particle to be too slow, for, so no, for the whole system to be too slow, it actually suffices for just a handful of particles, maybe one particle. If one particle is very, very slow, then because of this, um, because of the fact that the particles cannot kind of overcome each other, if one particle is very, very slow, then, then the whole system is slow. So the too slow condition actually has probability kind of in, e to the minus n. And uh, so the conjectural uh, idea is that here you have dimer-like phases. Can I think of too slow as saying that it doesn't wrap around? It doesn't wrap, so, so it wraps around well, at, a, at, a, at a slower pace. Actually, any slower pace would, would need. Would, would, any slower than the prediction. Any there. slower than the free evolution. So this, this, this is known, this, is, this has a form. So I don't want to write it down because I don't remember it, but it has some kind of simple rational formula. Um, and the too fast, uh, actually, condition has, has a very different asymptotic order because for particles to move too fast, every particle must move too fast, which means that every particle must have a... So why is it e to the minus n? Because for one particle to be too slow, it means that its coin flipping must kind of slow down. It's a large deviation event. So that, that's, that's, the, that's the typical probability of a large deviation event. Now, for too fast, many particles must do that at the same time, which means that the too fast probability has hap happens at the cn square rate. That's that's a whole that's a whole different you know order of smallness, and uh, because of that actually, uh, and that's proven. So so this is uh, this is due to Amol Agarwal, uh, 2020, let's say. Um, so do not exist. Uh, pure phases um, do not exist local, you know, local states, pure states, or translation variant ergodic Gibbs measures do not exist with the slope because this conditioning kind of messes things up. Okay, so so this is proven. Uh, these these guys are not not well understood. The KPZ thing is well understood. All right, so this is one of the open problems that. You know this program should should think about. I think. Okay, so let's um, light right. So uh, when I talk about particles, so I, I should have I should have told you the other continuous time limit of the six vertex model, which is the asymmetric simple exclusion process. Which I'm not going to study. I'm not going to discuss this one, but just just as a um, illustration. So uh, when you take the stochastic six vertex model and you let b1 and b2 just go to zero at the same rate, so that b1 over b2 stays the same, 
Um, it's my parameter t, by the way. It's not time. It's my whole little bit parameter t. Uh, so then uh, what happens to each trajectory of each particle? So suppose that I start with a, with a spin and let it evolve freely. If it's only one spin, then uh, because b1, b2 is the probability to go straight, then what, what this, this thing wants to do is actually wants to do a staircase motion. Right? But then occasionally, maybe with probability, so if these, if these are proportional to some delta, then with probability delta, the spin will occasionally do one step up or down. So this is actually t delta, and this is delta. Okay? And uh, if you have several spins, then uh, you know, suppose, that, suppose that you have uh, one more spin living close to it, and then, you know, if, if this, um, right, so, so if this spin lives here, then uh, my top spin jumped to the right, then, then it kind of touches the, the other one, which is okay, this is allowed. But then if, if, if this other spin, if, if this spin wants to jump to the right one more, then, then it's forbidden. So if I take, if I take time, to be order of delta inverse and project all the staircases on the, on the space in this way, then all these, all these staircases will be just moving in continuous time according to the ASAP rules. So each particle jumps left or right with jump rate one or t, and they cannot jump into each other. And then all this discussion you should also be discussing in terms of ASAP. So then, then it makes sense. What, what does it mean for particles? Why, why slowing down doesn't work like this, and so on. But for a six vertex model, it also makes sense. Okay, um, right. So let's uh, see. Do you have any questions at this point? Uh, okay. So let's go back to the whole little wood. Here are the two pictures, by the way. If you, I don't know if you see them. Um, Right. Well, you've seen you've seen lots of uh, pretty pictures, dimer-like pictures, and these are roughly the same feeling. So um, let me start with let me start the second part with discussing how how the previous computation of whole little wood Cauchy identity uh, applies to this to this thing. So remember the. Um, Remember the weights that we had? So, so there is a, um, there is a B1, uh, yeah, so there is a, I guess T should be here, so let me correct a little bit to match, to match the previous notation. So, um, so this is the stochastic six vertex model, and uh, these are the whole little wood weights. And uh, we used the uh, Young-Baxter equation to prove the Cauchy identity for the whole little woods. And the whole computation looked roughly like this. So I'm not going to repeat most of the details, but, but we, we just compute. So, so little wood, whole little wood and six vertex model. So the goal here is to connect particle system to symmetric functions. Much like logistic decreasing subsequences are connected to Schur polynomials, six vertex model is connected to whole little wood polynomials. So the Cauchy identity, uh, to prove the Cauchy identity, we use the, the following computation of the partition function. So we started with these, these are W weights, these are W star weights. So we had um, M equal 2, N equal 3. And we, we, we took this partition function, so this, this, this represents F lambda, this represents G, G lambda V. And uh, so I, I'm taking partition function in the half infinite strip, so this goes up to infinity, and I want I want these rows to depend on the parameters ui, and these rows to depend on the parameter vj, and I have parameters. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking to get a partition function for f lambda of u's 
g lambda of v's. And this partition function looks like this. So you, you, put, you put boundary conditions and you put, um, you put the crosses uh, on the right, track the crosses, and the partition function was, was the same as the following. So this partition function equals the, that other partition function. So the partition function on the right is, is just uh, fixed. So it's, there is only one configuration that I, that I drawn. And, and here the partition function is uh, a sum over all configurations like this. So there are many configurations. And uh, when I'm doing probability, I, I should think of this as, as a random ensemble of paths. OK? So basically, uh, we should, instead of just computing partition functions, we should look at this computation, re recall it back, and ask ourselves, how would I actually start from here and sample the other, the other parts? How to sample the, um, the left-hand side? It's actually um, very close to shuffling algorithm. Right? Once, once, you have, once you have a computation, once you have a cluster of mutation, then, then you can use it and turn it into a shuffling step. Now here, I also have, actually, it's not just a computation, right? It is done step by step, so I'm, I'm moving the cross back and forth. So it's all, it's all done step by step. So instead of just computing partition functions, so what we computed is, is, is this. Um, Um, but starting from here, instead of just computing the left-hand side and right-hand side, I can actually use it to, sh to sample to sample the uh, random configuration. We, we can do this not yeah we can do this not at the whole picture but in, in the step-by-step -step, um, regime by, by just looking at how how we could use the Young-Baxter equation to sample. So so Young-Baxter equation and uh, and uh, sampling, or you can use words coupling or probabilistic bijection. Probabilistic bijection or bijectivization. That's an uh, invented word for easier Google that we put in our papers with Bufetov and others. Um, so, this is much like RSK. In RSK, you have an identity you try to match term by term. So this term goes to that term. This monomial goes to that monomial. Here, when, when, you, when you put T in, term by term is no longer possible. So bijection is no longer possible. You actually have to match you know, a piece of something into a piece of something. So let me, let me, let me define what I mean by, 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 these, by these words. So suppose that you have an identity, which is like a Young-Baxter equation, or maybe some other identity. And suppose it has uh, just you know a few terms on each side, finitely many terms. Then uh, by probabilistic bijection, I mean uh, a Markov transition probability matrix that goes from uh, you know from the left hand side to the right hand side. So A, B, and C, and D are objects like like diagrams in the Young-Baxter. And then W is a weight of a diagram. So the weights on the left hand side are the same, summed to the same thing as the weights on the right hand side. And I want the uh, Markov transition matrix, uh, meaning, so this is a Markov transition matrix. Which, if, you, if you're talking about couplings, we, then, then, I, I, then I just want uh, a coupling of two probability distributions, one with weights proportional to WA, WB, and the other one proportional to WA, WC. So, so it's a Markov transition matrix, meaning, uh, um, it has non-negative entries. Some they sum to one over over rows, and um, so suppose I suppose this is alpha beta one minus alpha one minus beta, and they must map the distribution you know W A W B into W uh, C W D. So basically, uh, I can just write a bunch of 
equations. So Wa alpha should be Wc, Wa uh, 1 minus alpha should be Wd, and so on. Okay. So the Markov transition matrix, uh, it maps, maps the distribution Wa on two elements, Wa, Wb, divided by Wa plus Wb into, um, into the distribution Wc, Wd, divided by Wc plus Wd. Right, here is an example. Uh, tell, tell, me, tell me an identity. Or I can tell you an identity. So let's, let's say 2 plus 5 equal 3 plus 4, okay? That's an identity. So now, now I, want, I want to have a probabilistic bijection. You cannot map term by term, right? So, so 2 cannot ma map to 3 and 5 cannot map to 4 because they're not equal. They don't have the same weight. But instead I can take, you know, 2 and, two, two and 5, 3 and 4, and then I can say, well, okay, so actually it's, it's, not, it's not a unique, uh, it's not a unique choice of, um, of a Markov transition matrix because, well, coupling is not unique. There are many different couplings. So something I can, uh, I can do is just, so, so the, first, the first thing um, I can do is I can take independent coupling, right? So the two would be distributed between three and four proportionate to three and four. So the transition probabilities would be, so three over seven times, times two, four over seven times two, and then six plus eight over seven is equal to two. So, so these are, uh, oh, transition, yeah, okay, so transition probabilities. So um, let me just, yeah, so they, they sum to one. I, I don't want to multiply by that. So, so, so the transition probabilities like that would, would just work. You forget about where you come from, two or five, you just independently distribute. Or maybe, maybe you can do something else. So uh, maybe you can say, well, what if my uh, whole two goes into four and nothing from two goes into three? Then what is left is that five, you know, three-fifths of five must go to three, and then two-fifths of five must go to four. So that's another choice. Okay? Does it make sense? Whenever you have an identity, and especially in cluster algebras, you should be thinking about this. Okay? Uh, because cluster algebra identities, they, they all have kind of the same, even, even simpler. Right? It's one term equals sum of two other terms. Okay, so um, let's apply this idea to the Young-Baxter equation. So, um, okay, I, yes, I shouldn't, shouldn't have raised that. So, um, in the Young-Baxter equation would be, so these are the cross, the cross weights for the Young-Baxter equation. So the Young-Baxter equation has, has this, this format. So the weight of this configuration this is an example of the Ambexter equation that is involved in this proof. So one of the, one of the uh, identities is, is this thing. So if I want to kind of, like in which direction do I want to take the transition matrix? So actually, I want to go, so I want to have a Markov transition matrix. Uh, from here to here, so from from the situation when when the cross is on the left into the situation when the cross is on the right. So you take a cross, you move it to the right, and and it it will randomly change your state of the of the picture. So if you take this cross uh, and move it to the right, then um, because the left hand side has only one term. So this is my A, this is my C, this is my D, and B is equal to zero, so B is non-existent. Uh, then the probability to go from A to C is what? Zero. 
Right, c, o c over a, c over c plus d, which is the same, right. Right, so it's, 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 it's the same as, uh, as, uh, as you just normalized. So, so whenever, whenever you have one term on, on, on the initial side, you can actually uh, just write it as a ratio of, of probabilities. Like, now, in this case, it's unique. Because, well, in this particular case, this choice of a coupling is unique. Okay, cool. So now let's repeat this computation of the partition function. And instead of every time just forgetting about the internal states and summing over them, we can actually remember them. Start from the configuration with, with a unique state and move the, move the cross to the right to generate a random picture like this. Um, when you move the cross, uh, so lots of different things can happen. Um, basically, what follows is, is like a really careful case-by-case -case analysis. So uh, it's best done by a computer, but you can just, you know, um, take a Young-Baxter equation. In this easy case, in this unique case, you would get an answer immediately. In the non-unique case, well, you would have to play with the formulas, you know. There is a one-dimensional family of solutions when all the Young-Baxter equations, because, uh, because the horizontal uh, line carries at most one arrow, then all the Young-Baxter equations, they at most have two terms on each side. And so when, whenever you have two terms, and, and these are rational functions in U and, T, in v and T, and uh, you have a, one parameter family of solutions, so you might just play with it, pick the solution that looks nice, that has the less complexity, because you have, you have the freedom to choose. Um, but in any case, it's all irrelevant. If you look, if you look only in, in the first column, actually because, um, because, of the, because of how the cross looks, in the first column, actually, the, the Young-Baxter Plays a, uh, Young Baxter has a unique um, term in the left hand side because if you have the boundary conditions, which is uh, empty on the top and full at the bottom, then among all the crosses that you can fit, is, there is only one cross that actually you can pick. All the other crosses don't, don't fit this boundary condition. Right? Which means that if you fix, if you fix in the Young Baxter equation, if you fix these two boundary conditions, like in my whole little computation, then in this case, you can only have one cross on the left-hand side. So, so actually, whenever, whenever you do a Markov transition matrix from the picture on the right-hand side to the picture on the left-hand side, if you just look at the first column, then all the randomness that comes from this bijectivization is actually going to be unique. You know, there is a unique Markov transition matrix that does something to the first column. Okay? Right, are you following? <laughs> Sorry, it's pretty, it's, it's like, I mean, it's pretty natural from probabilistic perspective, but, but you kind of have to like, yeah, um, convince yourself that what we are doing makes at least some sense. Um, so then in the first column, so in the first column, this is, this is a unique situation. So Markov transition matrix with, uh, with unique, with uniqueness in the first column. And so in the first column, there are basically six possibilities of, there are six possibilities of uh, transitions, and there are actually four, four types of Young-Baxter equations. So, so look at these four pieces. So there are, um, there are uh, configurations where G is an arbitrary non-negative number, of arrows that are going vertically. And so you can have that, you know, you can have that uh, in the vertical column, you have G and G and G, the same number of arrows in all the, in all the three. So, so this is Young-Baxter equation, right? So, so you need one vertical column. So suppose that you have boundary condition G here and boundary condition G here, then there is only one choice for the, for the middle state that has to be the same G. And then when you move the cross over, then this G cannot change to anything. It has to, still has to stay the same. And uh, remember that here in, in, in my Young-Baxter equation, you know, th these guys go up, these guys go down. 
these, these arrows move up and move down. And then um, there is one more situation when there is unique choice, when you have kind of, uh, well, the, the cross on the left has to be the same. Now, if you take boundary conditions G and G plus two, then there is only one choice of G plus one here. When you cross, move crossover, then it must stay G plus one. There is no other choice. There is no other terms in the Ambexter equation. Now, if you go, if you go to like other conditions G and G plus one, then this thing in the middle could be G or could be G plus one. But when you, when you do, now, now, but this is fixed. This is given for you because when you, when you start moving the cross, you know what it is already. So you just have one of the two cases that's on the left. And then you move the cross over, and, uh, and this is not moved. This is not moved. OK, so I have to, <laughs> have to correct that. Sorry about this. So then when you move the cross over, then something must, must actually change. And uh, it can change in, 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 in two ways. So here's my boundary conditions. So this is G. Right, so, so the, yeah, so when you move the crossover, then this G, middle G can go to G plus one or middle G can go to, can stay G and this, this affects how the next cross looks like. And then uh, for, the, for the other Jan Baxter equation, you know, for the, for the further train argument, you would just pick this cross and move it further to the first column, the second column. And then, you know, then the cross will have different states and then you have to be careful what happens and there is no uniqueness anymore. But in the first column it is. And so basically uh, to, get, to get a transition probability, you would just compute, you would just compute the ratios of the weights. Okay, so, so we can compute this. So this full cross is one over this thing is always one minus T UV over one minus UV. And then um, this one is one. This one is, um, I have to remind myself. See, the whole, the whole, like, the whole story is you have, you have a lot of cases and you have a lot of tables and you just look in the table, pick a case, and, uh, or better, better yet, teach your computer to do that. This is, this is not V. This is uh, V times one minus T. 1 minus t g plus 1 divided by, well, actually, this is the same, so it cancels out. And this is g plus 1, which is u. So, so it's basically u v 1 minus t g plus 1. So there is, a, some, there is some miracle that in all these computations, all the g's, all the t to the g's cancel out here. Actually, the transitions do not depend on g, really. Um, so this cancels out. There is, there is u. Uh, there's one, there is um, g plus one. That's, that's here, that's g plus one. There is g, okay, so sorry, there is g here. So it's also u. So actually this, this um, w, w star actually cancels out. So this, this, rate, this fraction doesn't make sense, doesn't, doesn't matter. So, so this probability is equal to one minus, one minus UV or one minus TUV. Okay. Um, so there are six probabilities like that because you have two equations with one thing equal one thing, and then you have two equations with one thing equal the sum of two things. So you have ratio of this divided by this, this divided by this, and they sum to one, and this divided by this, this divided by this, they sum to one. So there are six probabilities, and actually it turns out that they are going to be the six vertex model probabilities. So it turns out that um, so, um, so the probability of, let's say, g, g plus 1, g plus 1 to go into g is that, 1 minus uv. 1 minus T U V. Now if you put G plus 1 here, this would be minus that, 1 minus that because they're, they're, they're stochastic. So the only other thing that you need to really compute is probability uh, G plus 1 G G going to G plus 1 G plus 1 G. 
So let's compute that. Um, that would be from, from the first equation. So here you get, uh, again, this factor 1 minus tuv over 1 minus uv downstairs. And uh, so to, 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 get, to get this, I, I, should, I should look at these two things. So I take ratio of this divided by that. So this, this cross has, rate, has um, probability t, the empty cross has, oh, the full cross has probability t. Okay, so the, the full cross has weight t. So I, I made a slight mistake here. So you look at the table, it's multiplied by t. All right, so, so now, now this is the same computation, uh, but without the t. So, so in the end, you get 1 minus uv, 1 minus tv. So uh, this will be your b1, and the, the other one will be your b2. Okay, now <laughs> the only thing that remains is, is we need to recognize how to kind of match. Um, right, so, so what, what happened is that when, when you go, when you construct a Markov map from this side to that side and look at the first column, then in the mi minimum, you know, elementary step, somehow there are six vertex probabilities. So the T and, and UV play the same role as, as this parameter U here and, and T. So this one is B1, the other one is B2. Okay? So... It remains to kind of stitch this thing together, stitch these two constructions together, and recognize that this G should play the role of the height function of the six vertex model. So, um, okay, I'm going to erase this, and I'm going to, to match these probabilities to, this, to the height function. So, what is the height function? So the height function actually you can define in the dual lattice, in the, in the faces, how many paths are below. And uh, the height function basically has the following. So, so this height function is g, g, and g, and g, right? It's all the same. And uh, the transition is that, basically, what, what, what is the stochastic six vertex model? So, so suppose, that, suppose that you know the incoming state into a vertex, which means that what, what do you exactly know? You know, actually... Uh, you actually know the states of the height function in the three cells. And now, now you flip a coin to determine the fourth one. So, you, so this goes here, it stays g plus one, or it goes up, it's, it becomes g. Um, so basically what, what happens is that you need to take these columns of three numbers and kind of bend them like this, and uh, instead of this, Instead of a transition like this, you should read this transition as a transition from here to here. Okay? And then so from this number to this number. Okay, so if you go into this table, do this to everything. So this is g, g plus 1, g plus 2, and this is g plus 1. And now this is g, g, g plus 1, g plus 1, and so on. And so basically what you see is that uh, this should be matched to uh, the transition. So the first one, the B1, should be matched to like G, G plus 1, G plus 1 is this. And this, this goes like, this is the probability to go up, which should be B1. Yep, that's B1, great. And uh, so this is, this is the probability G, G plus 1, G plus 1 going to G, G, G plus 1, and then B2 is the other way. It's the, it's the probability G, G, G plus 1 going to G, G, G plus 1 going to G, G plus 1, G plus 1. Okay. All right, that's the six vertex model. So what we proved uh, using scratch, which is the young baxter equation, uh, like from, from the first principles, we proved the following theorem um, that when you, when you start from, from here, everything is zero up to here. All the, all the column numbers are zero up to here. And then they start to go up by one. What does it mean? And basically, 
basically means that you're dealing with the domain wall boundary condition. So I have this stochastic six vertex model, stochastic six vertex model, where now at the x, y, at x, y, we have, uh, we have the u parameter instead, instead to be a product of two parameters, ux times vy. Um, or actually, I think it should be uy times vx, one, one of them. And then uh, we look at the height function. So we, ha we, we have the, the whole evolution of the vertex model. We look at the height function h of xy, and then uh, h of xy has the same distribution has the same distribution as uh, m naught of lambda, which is the n minus lambda one prime, it's the number of columns, n is equal to y, in uh, whole Littlewood uh, random partition, distributed as uh, f lambda, so with probability proportional to f lambda of u1 ui, g lambda of v1 vx. Okay, so it doesn't only solve the six vertex model, but actually you can put in for free inhomogeneous parameters. Okay, so that's that's a, that's the start of the story. How you can how you can prove the Tracy Wooden fluctuations, it's only the beginning because now you have to deal with the whole little random partitions and say, well, but now I have a whole little random partition. Can I, can I do anything with it? Can I study asymptotics? Well, it turns out you can, it's, uh, it's, it's accessible because um, whole little polynomials are eigenfunctions of certain nice operators that you can write as contour integrals and uh, then you can do asymptotics eventually. I'm not going to show. What I'm going to show in the last uh, 25 minutes is, is a different topic about six vertex model. Do you have any questions on this one? Okay, so, um, so the last piece is I'm going to uh, actually talk about something that uses the same idea but in a different setting. So uses the same idea exactly. To, to, to go back to the stochastic six vertex model and, and, and different uh, translation variant Gibbs measures. There is at least one uh, nice tool that exists that comes out of this idea of projectivization that can, can help to study. Right, so Besides, you know, uh, besides being stochastic, these, these weights actually also satisfy the M-Baxter equation. So, so number three, I want, I want to construct, I want to show how, look, how, how you can construct and how it looks at dynamics on, uh, on, on configurations on, on, on six vertex configurations. And this dynamics uh, generalizes the one studied by uh, Borodin Ferrari and uh, Fabio Toninelli later on dimers. And Toninelli and Sunil Chito as well. So, so they have some works that uh, introduce dynamics that's pretty natural, that looks on, uh, that, that lives on dimer configurations or Lozenstallings or domino tilings as well. The dynamics is not local. Um, it can move things far away but it preserves the translation variant ergodic Gibbs measures. So the same, the same story you can, you can do for the six vertex model. And the dynamics is not as easy to come up with, but one of the ways to come up with this dynamics is, is through the M-Baxter equation. So these weights of the six vertex, they satisfy the M-Baxter equation as well, uh, which looks like this. So, so you have, maybe you have parameters U1, U2, and here you need to take parameters. So, so you just pick all, all, all weights to be the same, all weights to be, to be the stochastic six vertex weights. And uh, then the Young-Baxter equation 
we'll just have the same t but different u parameters, okay? So you take three vertices and uh, now I can even explain this yang bester equation to a probabilist uh, who doesn't know what partition function is. Basically, because a stochastic six vertex model, every vertex is a coin flipping mechanism that you know, takes, takes in some arrows and spits out a random collection of arrows, then um, you fix I1, I2, I3, and uh, there are eight choices for fixing I1, I2, I3. So for every one of the eight choices, you look at the joint distribution of the output. So you look at the joint distribution of these three orange things. So joint probability distribution here and there, they are the same. All right, so, um, and then when you, when you say that, well, two distributions are the same, but now can I couple them, kind of. And that's exactly what objectivization would do. Right, so, so there is a Young-Baxter equation for the stochastic six vertex model. Um, and we can, also, we can also do the same, the same bookkeeping of, uh, of, of making it into random transition. So, so from here, we use this, uh, this coupling, randomized bijection idea, um, to, construct, to construct transition probabilities from, from configuration on this lattice to configuration on this lattice when you move the cross over. Now we take, uh, to construct the dynamics, we take a big configuration of a uh, six vertex model, but because it's the Young-Baxter equation, we only, we only have to look at two lines because the, every, every cross movement only changes something that happens between two lines. So we take two lines, and so suppose that you have some kind of a configuration here, some configuration here, like this, and um, then you attach a cross. So it has to be it has to be empty, so maybe initially you start with an empty configuration, uh, or maybe actually you can start from the domain wall. So you can start from, from the same boundary conditions. You attach a cross that has weight one. So this cross now is, the, is, is one of the stochastic six vertex crosses. So you attach a cross, uh, then you move it over. So what, what, what it will change, it will, it will randomly resample this, this line. It will randomly resample this line. And so it will basically move every, potentially every uh, arrow, every vertical arrow will, will get moved. Uh, but some of them, uh, but, but, but the boundary conditions on top and the bottom will be the same, will, will stay the same, will stay untouched. And so, uh, for example, it, it means that this, this middle one cannot move because it will always, Oh, actually, sorry, no, it, it actually can. So, so, so the middle column actually can become, can become this. So it can actually take, take this one, move it somewhere. So it's pretty complicated to explain what, what exactly happens. Uh, again, it's a careful bookkeeping of probabilities and tables. But you can construct the dynamics. So one, one cross movement would actually, uh, would actually flip the parameter. So if there is a parameter u1 and u2, then, then the u1 and u2 will be flipped. Which means that if you start from the stochastic six vertex measure, you know, statistical mechanical measure on this middle line, depending on these two parameters, then this Markov operation will, will map this measure to a measure with the flipped parameters. It will not preserve the measure, okay? How to make it preserve the measure? Um, actually, you have to take a limit. So, so if I take, yeah, so if I, if I define, if I denote this, measure mu u1, u2, then I construct t, which depends on the ratio, actually it depends on, on all of them, uh, t u1, u2, you know, acting on measure u1, u2, gives you measure u2, u1. But these two measures are not the same. Uh, so, so mu is the distribution of the middle line. Um, so now we need to take a limit as u1 goes to u2. A limit, u1 goes to u2. If the u1 goes to u2, then, then this cross depends on the ratio, and um, so b1 is um, b1 is equal to t1 minus u1 
1 minus u over 1 minus tu. So if the ratio goes to 1, if the parameters become the same, ratio goes to 1, then b1 becomes uh, 0, which is a degeneration. So, it's a, so if you just, you cannot take, you cannot just straightforwardly set u1, go, u1 equals u2. If u1 is equal to u2, then the coupling, you know, train, the Ambaxter train that goes through this line would actually not touch anything, will act as an identity. Because, you know, this, the measure stays the same. Why would I touch anything? No, I shouldn't. So when the measure stays the same, there isn't, the, the coupling is trivial, there is an identity. So it means that when you take this limit, we also need to uh, rescale, rescale time. So you actually have to take this t and apply it many times. When you apply it many times, then it actually, well, this, this, this is no longer valid. You know, you kind of have to forget about the measures for a while and look at the just the Markov operation, apply it many times to something, and then rescale time like, like I showed you how you know, things converge to us. Because you do something with a low probability of success, but you do it many, many times, then, then this allows you to rescale time from discrete to continuous. So then it will become a continuous time uh, process. So this will lead you uh, to a continuous time, a continuous time uh, process. On, on stochastic six vertex configurations. So it will be continuous time process. Why? And, and what happens is that you should actually not restrict, when, when you're doing continuous time, it means that uh, you know, every something will have an alarm clock, and then when the alarm goes off, something happens. Now, because uh, you're doing this rescaling, it's not enough to restrict yourself to one line, but actually you have to combine all the lines and put alarm clocks everywhere. And so basically, I can tell you what the result dynamics looks like. Um, and uh, you can actually drop the stochastic six vertex condition, have arbitrary A1, A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, C2. And so the um, dynamics just looks, looks the following. So, so the rate, um, right, so, What's, how, how, does, how does the dynamic look like? So dynamics um, will we'll look at um, all possible vertical edges. So, so suppose, that, suppose that I'm in the lattice. Suppose this is empty. So I have a vertical edge that's empty. So I will put an alarm clock on it. So every vertical empty edge will, will have an alarm clock. When the alarm clock rings, then, um, then this so if the alarm clock rings, then I have to look at what happens around this edge. And suppose that, suppose that something like this happened around the edge. Suppose that this, this thing has, has rang the alarm clock. Then it will attract an arrow from the right. Why from the right? Because I'm moving across from left to right, so I cannot do like this cannot depend on the left. The left is already sampled, I cannot touch it. So I will attract a vertical arrow from the right to move here. So, so this, this configuration will, will actually turn into, turn into this. But then I have to continue and deterministically fix the configuration. And this fixing procedure will actually can go for millions of steps. It can go very far, so we have to prove that this actually makes sense as a continuous time Markov chain, so that you don't have infinitely many jumps in finite time. OK. So uh, with that definition, uh, with that understanding, let me show you, let me show you the rates. So the rate at, um, so the rate to attract a line, and you, you can also actually, um, you can also remove the line in the same way. So if, if there is a, if there is a event at this line, then it means that I have to drop this and, uh, and kind of move it to the right. So, so it means that this arrow has to turn and, and move, and then I have to fix the configuration. So the, this rate is equal to C1, C2 over square root of 
a1, a2, b1, b2. So there are some rates depending on the, on the uh, a's and b's in the six vertex models. So there are, there are six cases. And uh, the other ones are like this I showed you. And, uh, and they're kind of dual. There are, there are two rates, one, one for adding, one for removing. And then the third case is this. And this is just one over that. So rates must be non-negative, but they, could, they, they don't have to be less than one. OK, so uh, this is the dynamics on the six vertex model. Um, what we proved, uh, so this is, this is from the work with uh, Matthew Nicoletti, who's coming to the program next week. So what we proved with him is, is when you restricted the stochastic six vertex model case, and you pick your uh, translation variant ergodic Gibbs measure on the, on the full plane, that's in the KPZ phase. So it's not a dimer-like model, not a dimer-like trajectory, but a trajectory of the free evolution. Then, then that, this dynamics makes sense on that measure. The measure is simpler. It's much simpler than a dimer, dimer model um, because it's, you know, it has independence. It's a free evolution, so um, it's easy to control. Uh, and we also proved that if you restrict everything on the torus and you run this dynamics, then it preserves the stochastic six vertex model. Sorry, not the general six vertex model on the torus. And on the torus, you can also use the Ambaxter equation to construct the dynamics. Um, so let me just show you one reduction, how it's, uh, how it's relevant to dimers. So back to dimers. Uh, I'm going to specify, specialize to the five vertex model. Five vertex model, five vertex model has A2 equals zero. So this A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, C2. Um, so I'm forbidding this thing, and then I put everything else to one, and this will put to R, and this is the five vertex that uh, Kenyon, De Geer, and um, Watson studied. Um, so this is the reduction of the uh, six vertex model. If you look at this, um, if you look at this, these rates, and you set A2 equal to one, then uh, A2 equal to zero, what happens? Um, and something blows up, but, it, but not to worry because this is a jump rate thing. So first you can actually rescale them. The dynamics, if it preserves the measure, you speed it up or slow it down, it doesn't matter. So, so actually you can rescale it by A2 first. So this will get another square root of A2. This is, this is the same dynamics. I'm just multiplying everything by square root of A2. Then I set A2 equal to zero, so this, this disappears. And then um, this becomes one. Okay, so so for, the, for the Kenyan's uh, model, this becomes one. And this becomes uh, uh, R square. Okay. And uh, now I can decipher what does this model do. Um, so in the five vertex situation, uh, it's pretty easy. The, the paths are non-intersecting. And because they're non-intersecting, actually some configurations also fall out from here. So look at that. Uh, this, this these, these two things don't, don't matter, so you can just ignore them. So you, can, you only have two possible transitions out of six. And for them, you would just decipher what happens, okay? So in the five vertex situation, uh, paths look like non-intersecting lattice paths. And uh, do something like this. Now, um, what, is the, what is the jump rate? So, so basically what, what, you see, what you see is that you look at all possible unoccupied vertical edges and you set an alarm clock with rate one or R square to them, right? So this will be rate one, rate one, rate one. This will be rate R square, this will be rate one, R square, one, R square, okay? When the clock rings, just attract the rightmost, um, rightmost vertical edge. So suppose that this clock rings, it means that 
the spin just, just flies into here. That's the dynamics. So if r is equal to 1, everything is uniform. This is equivalent to, uh, uh, well, there is a paper by Tony Nelly from 2015 about the dynamics that preserves the ergodic. So if r is equal to 1, then this is a dimer model. So you can map non-intersecting lattice paths to lozenges, and this will be just exactly the lozenge model. Lozenge dimer model, which has translation variant ergodic Gibbs measures that are determinantal. And this dynamics with R equal 1 preserves them. And actually, Tony Nello also, also, also showed that, well, show, first, first of all, sh he showed that dynamics is well defined on this. Second, that, uh, second he computed the, the, the speed of growth. So depending on the slope of the Gibbs measure, because remember, Gibbs measure is parameterized by two, by two real parameters, the slope. So the Tony Nello showed computed the speed of growth. And um, now if you just put r in, in, in it, uh, the vertex model is no longer stochastic, which means that uh, translation variant ergodic Gibbs measures are neither free Markov evolutions, which are easy, nor determinantal, which is not, not, not easy, but it's, it's, it's tractable, it's been done. But when you put r in it, here is the dynamics, very simple. But we don't know the measures. We, we, have, we have no control. We have no idea what the measures are. They are the stationary measures. They're, they're measures of, this six, uh, of the five vertex model. Uh, you can characterize them using beta and Zatz solutions, maybe. I would like to see the speed of growth here. I don't know what it is. I don't have a conjecture. I don't have a formula. Uh, the formula, by the way, is pretty complicated. It involves tangents, sine of densities of, I mean, of the parameters of the slope. Um, so here, the formula would be a deformation of that. And uh, I think it is a tractable problem, reasonably tractable. So for the afternoon, I'll, 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 I'll just mention that again, OK? And with this, I stop. Thank you. <laughs>